Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. You guys are lucky. You're getting two for the price of one today. But I digress. I'll get to that later. I want to start by telling you a love story. So this story is about my parents. My father is from Thailand. He didn't grow up with a lot of money. He, his father left the family when he was very young, and his mother died when he was seven. So he was raised by an assortment of aunties and uncles. My mother, 3,000 miles away in Japan, came from completely opposite circumstances. She came from a relatively privileged family. She was one of three sisters. They all went to university, which in those days was quite rare for a Japanese woman. So how would these two people ever come together? How would they meet? Well, my father, despite not having gone to university, was quite enterprising and clever. He loved cars. So he went to Japan to study. This is in the 1960s during Japan's post-war economic boom. He met my mother in Tokyo. She was working at the Imperial Hotel, and they started dating. My father tells me on one of their dates at the Imperial Hotel, my mom was wearing a kimono, and he was walking down a spiral staircase to greet her. And she turned and she looked at him, and that's the moment he fell in love. Well, as you can imagine, my grandparents were like, hell no, there's no way you're marrying a foreigner, and there's no way you're marrying a guy from Thailand who doesn't have any money, much less a college education. My father, though, was convinced that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with my mother. He wrote letter after letter to my grandfather, trying to convince him. And finally, when my grandfather actually met my father, saw his strength of character, he agreed. So this is my parents in 1968 on their wedding day in America, and they've been married for 46 years. Awesome story. So I've been thinking a lot about my parents and their journey. I've been thinking a lot about how two people from two completely different cultures, backgrounds, socioeconomic status, how do they come together, then move to a third country and have a child? And then I realized that's what I've done with my life, either consciously or subconsciously, and that's what so many of us have done in Hong Kong. So I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. I am 38 weeks pregnant, so it's nothing short of a miracle that I'm here today. I'm glad the baby didn't come. But I'm thinking a lot about two weeks from now. I'm thinking about my son. It's a boy. Um, and I'm thinking that this little guy inside of me is really such a unique, unprecedented blend of things. My son is going to be half Greek, a quarter Japanese, a quarter Thai. His mom has a US passport, and his dad has a UK passport. So what does that make him other than really, really confused? Well, the interesting thing is that kids like this, these mixed up kids from everywhere, are the future. Kids like this are going to be the norm, not the ex exception anymore. In the U.S., we're on the brink of a demographic revolution driven by two things, immigration and intermarriage. Nearly one in all seven new marriages in the U.S. now is between two people of different races. And if you look at this map, you can see that it tilts west. In California, the rates are about 20 percent. Hawaii has the highest rate at over 40 percent. But in the south and in the Midwest, it's still very low. But what this means is, as more people intermarry and come together, you've got more kids who are a blend of so many different things. The multiracial population in America is booming right now. It's increased by 50% to 4.2 million people since the year 2000. This is huge. And what does this mean for our society? It means that by 2060, non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority in America. Now, I know that in our little expat enclave in Hong Kong, we don't even blink when we see a multiracial couple. I mean, how many times do you see an Asian woman with a white guy? It's, you see it all the time. You don't think about it. But this is not the norm. 
for the rest of the world. I mean, we are blessed to be here. We are blessed to be surrounded by so much diversity and so much acceptance. But still, this is not representative of the real world at all. Just to show you, this is a picture of my daughter's school class, and she's the circled one. It's very diverse, as you can tell. But look at this picture from 25 years ago. That's me in a sea of Caucasian faces. We were the only Asian family on our block growing up in Springfield, Virginia, okay? I don't know if you know where Springfield, Virginia is, but it's kind of the south, close to Washington, D.C. But 25 years ago, there were no Asian kids there. Kids would come to my house and they'd say, why do I have to take off my shoes? What, what are those long, skinny things that you use to eat with? Why does it smell like soy sauce? And then the question that I got all the time, which I hated, was, where are you from? How many of you have gotten this question before? Where are you from? What are you? Yeah? They don't mean geography, because I would say, I'm from Springfield, Virginia, and they'd say, no, no, where are you really from? Right? And as a kid, you know, you're like six or seven, you're confused. You say, well, I'm American, I'm just like everyone else, I'm from Springfield. No, what they really wanted to ask me was, why do you look different than me? Why don't you have blonde hair and blue eyes? Why do you have Asian features? And so, as a child, it was quite confusing. I, I didn't really know how to answer this. I didn't know what to say. I became very adept at switching my identity, depending on what circumstance I was in. In America, I was completely American. Years later, when I moved to Japan, I was very, very Japanese. So, it's interesting because when I talked to my other friends who were biracial or multiracial, they had exactly the same experience that I did, which was they completely adapted their identity. It became a very fluid thing, depending on what circumstance they were in. So, by the time I was in my early 20s, I got so fed up, I thought, all right, I'm going to move to Japan and work there. And I thought, okay, I'm finally going to fit in. No one's going to ask me where I'm from. I look Japanese enough. I speak fluent Japanese. It'll be fine. And then a strange thing happened. Japanese people didn't know what to make of me either. They would look at my business card and they would say, Mariko san chanta. And I would say, yes, my father's Thai, my mother's Japanese. And they would say, ah, hafu. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Japan that well, hafu means half Japanese. I mean, it's the worst word ever. Why would anyone want to be half of anything? It's so derogatory. My friends and I used to joke that it should be double, not half. But I just remember thinking, I move halfway across the world to a country where I finally think I'm going to fit in, be accepted, belong. But yet, people still feel the need to put me in a box, to categorize me. They say the human brain registers race in one-tenth of a second. That's the blink of an eye. We register race even before we register gender. That's how powerful it is. That's how powerful our brain is when it comes to categorizing people. Some of you might recognize this stunning, intelligent woman. Her name is Ariana Miyamoto. She just won the Miss Universe Japan pageant about a month ago. She's half black and half Japanese. She has a Japanese passport, was born in Japan, and went to Japanese schools her whole life. She said that when she was growing up in Japan, children wouldn't want to touch her because they were afraid her color would rub off on them. They would throw trash at her. They wouldn't get in the swimming pool with her. The reason why she even felt compelled to participate in this pageant was because one of her friends had committed suicide because they had been so ostracized and bullied for being half. After she won this pageant, despite it being a huge accolade, there was an internet frenzy with people saying, how can she possibly represent Japan? She doesn't look Japanese. She's not the right color. This woman is not pure Japanese. She can't represent Japan. So it just goes to show you, this is 2015 people. And despite the fact that in Hong Kong, we're quite oblivious to this because we do live in a very tolerant society. 
Things in the rest of the world aren't shifting so much. People still see things through a very, very narrow lens. I was at a dinner party in Discovery Bay a few months ago, and I was sitting next to a guy from New Zealand. And he looked at me and he said, wow, your English is really good. And then I replied, so is yours for a Kiwi. But it just goes to show you that one-tenth of a second it took him to recognize me as Asian. He assumed that I am Asian from Asia, thus I couldn't speak English as a first language. So old habits die hard. It wasn't until the year 2000 that we could actually tick more than one box on the US Census saying which race we were. Up until then, people like me, multiracial, biracial people, had to only choose one thing which is quite difficult. So if you ask me what I'm thinking about now, I'm clearly thinking about the future. I'm thinking about two weeks from now, when another human being is going to be born into this crazy, mixed up, wonderful world. I'm thinking about my daughter, and I'm thinking about what her experiences are going to be like. Will she be ostracized or will she be accepted? Will she be Japanese one day, Greek the next, Thai another? Will she bounce around the world like her parents have, or will she yearn for the permanence of being in one place? What I can say is that intermarriage was not accepted during my parents' generation, but they overcame it. During my generation, I dealt and I struggled with the questions of race, identity, belonging, and acceptance. And now when I think about my kids, when I think about this third generation, and when I think about their experience, I'm thinking that their experiences are going to be so rich. They're going to grow up among so much diversity. Their stories are going to be so amazing. And ultimately, this is going to be so much more important and compelling than the question of where are you from. Thank you.